Thy mother felt more than a mother's pain, and yet brought forth less than a mother's hope. To wit, an indigested and deformed lump, not like the fruit of such a goodly tree. Hello everyone, and welcome to another edition of Ear Read This, a podcast providing critical introductions to our favourite works of literature. I'm Ash, your host, and today I'll be talking about Henry VI, Part 3, by William Shakespeare. The end of Part 2 was a cliffhanger. We left England at the outbreak of civil war as tensions between the houses of York and Lancaster finally boiled over. During the first battle of the Wars of the Roses at St Albans, Richard, Duke of York, triumphed over the forces of King Henry. Among the losses was the Earl of Somerset, who was killed by the misshapen son of York, another Richard, and future King of England, whose story will be told in our next and final history play. Part 3 picks up exactly where its predecessor left off. The defeated king continues hopelessly to strive for peace by making a shocking compromise with York. Henry will remain king, he says, but once he dies, the family of York can take the throne. By disinheriting his own son, Henry alienates his wife, Queen Margaret, and many of his followers as well. Equally unhappy with this decision are the sons of York, who berate their father for giving up the fight. So the truce was always going to be a brief one, and soon enough, the Wars of the Roses erupt into full bloody bloom. The play was first performed in around 1592, its next recorded full production taking place over three centuries later in 1906. As mentioned on previous episodes, in the intervening years, the Henry VI plays were more commonly performed in abridgments or adaptations, often shaping the material around a central character, such as Henry's Uncle Humphrey, the Duke of Gloucester, or Richard Plantagenet, the Duke of York. In fact, the first published edition of the play from 1595 carried the title The True Tragedy of Richard, Duke of York, with the death of good King Henry VI, with the whole contention between the two houses, Lancaster and York. This title highlights not only the secondary status of the king, but also the play's ambivalent view of York. Not by any means a straightforward antagonist prefiguring his outrageously villainous son, Instead, while York certainly is deceptive, he has legitimate frustrations with Henry, not to mention a stronger claim to the throne, being the heir general of Edward III. Defeated at the Battle of Wakefield, York is killed by the gloating Queen Margaret, his pathetic end bringing tears to the eyes of his enemies, like any true tragedy should. After York's death, the violence only escalates. The three sons of York, Edward, George and Richard, have a vision of three sons in the sky, the most blinding example yet of the cosmic and apocalyptic imagery running throughout these plays. Henry is dethroned after the Battle of Towton, and the eldest son of York becomes Edward IV of England. For the first time in this series, we see a king in exile, as Henry is forced into hiding in Scotland before being captured and imprisoned. From Scotland I am stolen, he says, even of pure love, to greet mine own land with my wishful sight. Gillian Day comments, as Henry's wandering journey through the play implies, kingship is something of a fugitive concept in part three. I wonder how the king escaped our hands is in fact the opening question of the play. With Henry locked away and Margaret in France, Edward IV's position looks secure. But his abrupt decision to marry angers his most powerful ally, Warwick, the kingmaker, who switches allegiances and helps restore Henry to the throne. More battles and double crosses follow, and by the end of the play, Warwick is dead, Edward returned to the throne, and Henry returned to the tower, where he is stabbed to death by the king's brother, the future King Richard III. The play covers battles, dethronements and murders from 1455 to 1471. It is a chronicle of blood and bitterness. Vengeance is on the lips of every character, it seems. In fact, the word revenge is said 20 times. Shakespeare had taken the narrative of avenging Bolingbroke's usurpation of Richard II from his source, Edward Hall. As for the satellite vengeances of characters like Warwick and Clifford, they had perhaps been inspired by the popular success of revenge dramas like Thomas Kidd's The Spanish Tragedy. 
There is a surplus of violence on stage. Apart from the battle scenes at Wakefield and Towton, we have murders, executions, heads stuck on poles, patricides, and the killings of children. The violence in the language is almost absurdly extreme. At one moment, Warwick is so overcome with rage that he says he'd rather chop off one of his hands and fling it at Gloucester's face with the other than kneel to him. Elsewhere, his eagerness to douse the earth in blood is so intense that he says he'd slaughter his own horse just to eliminate the possibility of leaving a battlefield. Today we'll talk about Shakespeare's full tilt into chaos, witness the tragedy of York and the sufferings of Margaret, the creation and rise of one of Shakespeare's most iconic villains, and the downfall of Henry VI. Joining me one more time to discuss Henry VI are Owen Horsley and Hayley Backrack, both of whom have been involved in productions of the plays. Hayley has worked on a version for The Globe, while Owen is co-directing a production for the RSC, due in 2022. You can hear more about their work in my extended interviews with both Hayley and Owen, and find their websites and Twitter pages in the episode description box below. You'll also find information about my third guest, actor Danielle Farrow, who is once again providing us with readings from the play. So a big last thank you to all my three contributors, and now let's get stuck into the third part of Henry VI. To kick us off, I asked Owen Horsley what it was about this period in history that held such an appeal for Shakespeare and his audience. I mean, I think, first of all, it's like, the bloodiest part one of the bloodiest periods of, of British history and I think it was during like it's interesting looking at 1590s in particular it felt like it's a little bit like you know the fact that superhero movies have become very popular in the kind of naughty. it's like it felt like there was a time when writing kind of history plays was very popular and in vogue yeah at the times so it's what the audience wanted and of course you know there are so many different histories to draw upon but this is particularly epic and particularly rife for great characters you know great battle scenes as well uh, great politics and i think there's something also i mean it's i'm a big marlow fan he's a mm. the hero of mine and it feels like there's something in the theater of that time which felt quite immediate so I don't, I mean, these plays have wonderful moments of reflection, but they're not, certainly not some of Shakespeare's later plays, which have, are much more concerned with the past, reflection, meditation on, you know, time. This is like the sense of politics happening now. And maybe, maybe there was just a, a real thirst for that at that time. One of the slickest political operators in these plays has been Richard Plantagenet, Duke of York. We've seen him in part one establish his claim to the throne before introducing the famous red and white rose of the coming wars in Shakespeare's invented temple garden scene. Here, Warwick, who always has a keen nose for bloodshed, said, Here I prophesy, this brawl today, grown to this faction in the temple garden, shall send between the red rose and the white a thousand souls to death and deadly night. York has shown his cunning. It was he in part two who lay a trap for the Duchess of Gloucester, and he who stirred up the rebellion of Jack Cade, as York himself was safely away in Ireland, amassing an army. Back in Richard II, we saw Bolingbroke usurp the king, but we never heard him planning it. In York, we have been able to witness a usurpation in development, and gained an insight into the tortured, stifled ambitions of the man who believes the throne by right belongs to him. The closer he gets to power, the more it warps him. Towards the end of part two, York is relishing the betrayal he will visit upon his enemies. My brain, more busy than the labouring spider, weaves tedious snares to trap mine enemies. Well, nobles, well, tis politically done to send me packing with an host of men. I fear me, you, but warm the starved snake who cherished in your breasts will sting your hearts. Given his all-consuming hunger for power, it is something of a surprise to see him relinquish the upper hand and let Henry keep the throne for the time being. Securing the crown for his bloodline at the cost of his immediate gain indicates a man who puts his family first. And his sons, Edward, George and Richard, are fiercely loyal to him, as we have already seen in part two, supporting their father in his challenge for the crown and swearing that if their words won't serve, their weapons shall. But the patience shown by Richard, Duke of York, is not shared by his traitorous brood. Immediately after Richard makes his oath to King Henry, his son Edward is advising him, For a kingdom any oath may be broken. 
I would break a thousand oaths to reign one year. Richard's resolution is broken by a single short speech from another of his sons, his namesake, the future Richard III. After his father says challenging again for the throne is impossible, the younger Richard argues, An oath is of no moment being not took before a true and lawful magistrate, that hath authority over him that swears. Henry had none, but did usurp the place. Then seeing twas he that made you to depose, your oath, my lord, is vain and frivolous. Therefore to arms! And father, do but think how sweet a thing it is to wear a crown. Within whose circuit is Elysium, and all that poets feign of bliss and joy. Why do we finger thus? I cannot rest until the white rose that I wear be dyed, even in the lukewarm blood of Henry's heart. Richard, enough, says his father the duke. I will be king or die. It is the latter destiny that meets him in the ensuing battle with Queen Margaret's forces at Wakefield. Knowing he has given battle in vain, Richard, Duke of York, invites his doom, saying to his enemies, I dare your quenchless fury to more rage. I am your butt, and I abide your shot. What follows is one of the play's most famous scenes, and the first of two scenes to feature characters sitting on molehills, something that prompts Stanley Wells to remark, Were molehills more substantial in those days? One is idly inclined to ask. York is surrounded by the bloody Clifford, the rough Northumberland, and that wrangling woman, Queen Margaret. Margaret takes charge, instructing the others as follows. Brave warriors, Clifford and Northumberland, come, make him stand upon this mole hill here, that wrought at mountains with outstretched arms, yet parted but the shadow with his hand. What? Was it you that would be England's king? Wast you that revelled in our parliament and made a preachment of your high descent? Where are your mess of sons to back you now? The wanton Edward and the lusty George. And where's that valiant crookback prodigy, Dicky, your boy, that with his grumbling voice was wont to cheer his dad in mutinies? Or with the rest, where is your darling Rutland? Look, York, I stained this napkin with the blood that valiant Clifford with his rapier's point made issue from the bosom of the boy. And if thine eyes can water for his death, I give thee this to dry thy cheeks withal. Alas, poor York. But that I hate thee deadly, I should lament thy miserable state. I prithee, grieve to make me merry, York. What, hath thy fiery heart so parched thine entrails that not a tear can fall for Rutland's death? Why art thou patient, man? Thou shouldst be mad, and I to make thee mad do mock thee thus. Stamp, rave, and fret, that I may sing and dance. Thou wouldst be feed, I see, to make me sport. York cannot speak unless he wear a crown, a crown for York, and lords bow low to him. Hold you his hands whilst I do set it on. I marry, sir, now looks he like a king. Aye, this is he that took King Henry's chair, and this is he was his adopted heir. But how is it that great Plantagenet is crowned so soon and broke his solemn oath? As I bethink me, you should not be king till our King Henry had shook hands with death. And will you pale your head in Henry's glory and rob his temples of the diadem now in his life against your holy oath? Oh, tis a fault too, too unpardonable. Off with the crown, and with the crown his head. And whilst we breathe, 
take time to do him dead. York responds to Margaret with what Tina Packer calls a diatribe against her unfeminine qualities. Whereas Margaret rails against York for his treachery, the breaking of his oath to the king, York's invective is all based on Margaret's gender, how she ought to behave and how disgraceful it is that a woman is behaving as she is. She wolf of France, York calls her, but worse than wolves of France, whose tongue more poisons than the adder's tooth. Women are soft, mild, pitiful and flexible. Thou stern, obdurate, flinty, rough, remorseless. Having outlived the likes of Suffolk and following the death of Henry's protector, Humphrey, Margaret and York have emerged as the two key opponents for control of England. York would seize the throne, whereas Margaret has already demonstrated how she might rule through her ineffectual husband. As Warwick says, she has wrought the easy melting king like wax. Margaret has proved herself more than equal to York in political skill, and there is plenty of dramatic possibilities in having these two manipulators silently acknowledge each other's talents as they work around the oblivious king. The vindictiveness of Margaret, flaunting the blood of Richard's murdered young son, implies an unusual hatred. It is not only gruesome, but prolonged, even intimate. Tina Packer says that upon first directing the molehill scene, I had Margaret cut off York's balls. When I was playing it myself decades later, his balls interested me not at all. It was his heart I wanted. York receiving a mock crown of bulrushes before being beheaded was a detail Shakespeare would have found in his sources, but this relished animosity between the Duke and the Queen is apparently his own invention. I think, and I mean, like, you know, it's all, it's all Shakespeare's history and then there's actual history. But I think mm. there must have been so much stuff within the actual history and the sources that Shakespeare used that you kind of go, this is a character to, to really mine for as much as possible in terms of, um, you know, her, her art, her skill, her politics, and how someone from the outside of this country comes in and essentially leads an army to protect it from, she, she, she adopts this kind of, love for this country mm. um, that is so ferocious which I think he must have gone this is a, a great character to look at and also just the tragedy of her story as well because you know she's a mother she falls in love as well like she, she goes through incredible amounts of grief as well but also I'm, I'm sure the thing is with Shakespeare I'm sure there must have been some practical elements where you just go like I've got a really good actor to play this part <laughs> yeah yeah um, well as someone who's done the later history plays, why, why do you think it is that there's, or is there any significance to the fact that there are at, at least one particularly strong female part and another fascinating one in Joan of Arc, however she's played, and, and there are not really many in the history plays that follow? Well, it's interesting because the women in the Henry Sixes actively take part in the play yeah. in the Henry Sixes, where... I think what he shifts towards in later history plays is that the the female characters become the moral heart of the play, the moral core of the play, which essentially mm. makes them less active and much more observers and 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 to, to some extent passive in the playing out of those plays. I think that's a real distinction: is that Margaret is no way of, uh, just there to be a moral centre of the play; no. she's there to take part. Yeah. And to prove that she can take part in the same way that Joan is as well. And the same way that mm. Eleanor is as well. They can't, all the women in this play are not going to sit back and not be active in it. Yeah. And that I feel like as we get into the later history plays, the, there's, the, there's no women that are doing that actively. In the first scene of part two, Margaret was wed to Henry, a man she had never met. In the first scene of part three, she renounces him calling him a timorous wretch and divorcing herself from his table and his bed until their son's inheritance is restored. Her transformation from outsider to leader of an English army is remarkable considering how Shakespeare treated the queens of future history plays. Isabella, wife of Richard II, despairs on the sidelines. Catherine, the French princess, is brutally wooed by the conquering Henry V. And the wife of Henry IV never even makes it on stage. Tina Packer suggests that Shakespeare may have written stronger female characters in his early career because he was used to playing them as a young actor. And critics like James Force have even suggested Shakespeare might have played Margaret himself. And it strikes me as unlikely just based on the age he must have been when he began mm. 
acting. It's see, you know, he was married at 18. And I think that we think he stuck around for at least a couple years after that. So to begin work as a boy player in your early 20s feels quite old. Yeah. I mean, I, he obviously to, be, to begin playing female roles, that feels old um, to me. Mm. Uh, I hadn't actually heard that uh, theory before. It's hard because we, I mean, we just don't really have any evidence about Shakespeare's kind of acting career. We have a lot of anecdotes and rumors, um, but it, it, it strikes me as unlikely just given his age. Would, would it be more like teenagers playing? The female roles. yeah yeah we're so, i mean this is an, this is there's some david kathman is this historian who's done this amazing archival work in he has this whole article that i think is just called like how old were boy players or mm. something <laughs> like that he's found that they tended to be the age that apprentices of in other professions were which is somewhere between sort of like 12 and 20. wow quite um, amazing isn't it to think of yeah. maybe a 12 year old playing <laughs> Margaret of Anjou. Yes, it seems unlikely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, of course, we're assuming the 12 year olds are playing the pages yeah, and yeah. the 20 year olds are playing Margaret and things. But I mean, I also think that, you know, to me, this this narrative that, you know, of course, when we look at just the history of plays, it's like, yes, there's clearly like we have Margaret in Henry the Sixth and we have Catherine in Henry the Fifth. Mm. And Catherine's a great role, but obviously nowhere she doesn't have nearly as much stage time or sort of presence as Margaret does. Mm. But this sort of narrative of female roles dropping off just doesn't really match up to what is kind of happening in Shakespeare's career overall. Like at the same time that he's writing the Henry the Fourth plays, he's writing Rosalind. Yeah. You know, so there's, I think, if anything, there's something interesting in the way that he sort of relocates his female characters mm. into other genres. He sort of seems to feel that he can't fit them into the history plays in the same way he was doing, or maybe that's just the nature of the period he decided to write about i can't kind of think of any female character female characters female historical figures there were plenty who were absolutely fascinating mm. in that period but i don't think any of them were sort of highlighted in the chronicles and the historical writing of the time in the way that margaret was in the reign of henry the sixth so he might have just been like oh well there's sort of no there's no meat here to kind of build upon he was short of them in his sources yeah yeah i mean i mean i i feel bad saying that because i i would need to double check but you know, I think Margaret sort of played an outsized role in the Chronicles compared to what many other women sort of managed to. This is a whole tangent. Some of, I mean, it's actually amazing to me how interesting the women that historically kind of in and around his court and in and around the families that are present in Henry the Fourth plays are. Mm. Um, his stepmother is fascinating. Oh, um, yeah. The only English queen to be accused of witchcraft. Interesting. Uh, yes. Is and, she the same uh, stepmother that Henry V later robbed of her... Uh, dowry. Yes. Yeah. What was her name? Yes. Again? Yeah. Um, Joanna of Britain. No, Joanna of. He so it's Henry the Fourth's second, second wife. wife. Yeah. 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 So she was she was born Joanna of Navarre and she married the Duke of Brittany. Was her first husband. Right. And then um, when Henry the Fourth was in exile in Brittany, he they met and seemed to have hit it off because they had what was like diplomatically a really shocking marriage after he got back to England and was king. Nobody can understand why it had happened. And like, it genuinely seems to be just like they were in love with each other because there was absolutely no political advantage to be gained on either side. Um, and then when Henry, she was extremely rich and no negotiated an amazing dowry, accumulated a ton of land and money. And then when Henry V needed to fund his wars in France, he uh, accused her of witchcraft so that he could impound all of her land and money and spend it on the wars. Right. Yeah. Which I suppose could be another, I was just about to say, so he had no excuse not to include a character like that, but actually maybe that's the reason. <laughs> that's not, <laughs> yeah. it's not a very famous Undermine. victory, is it? <laughs> no, no. But again, it's like a question of what uh, I don't, you know, are that, what are, he's reading his sources, you know, mm. what are they talking about? That's what's sort of directing his attention. So I don't think any of the sort of other women in that, in Henry the Fourth's reign sort of, obviously they talk about Margaret a lot because she was incredibly active in, sort of managing things for Henry the sixth when he was incapacitated or in prison. Mm. So um, yeah, there aren't quite as many, but I mean, it is, you know, when you look at Richard the third, which you, I think will have not done yet, almost all of the, the only, almost the only scenes in Richard the third that have no precedent in any of Shakespeare's sources, either dramatic or historical are the scenes with the female characters. So obviously in that play, he's like, 
forget the sources. This is part of the story. This is something that's really important to include. Yeah. And obviously he wasn't, I mean, I think he is thinking in the same way. Of course, you know, like this Lady Percy scene, both of them, her persuading Northumberland and her trying to persuade Hotspur aren't in his sources. Mm. That's something that he, it's, you can feel the same sort of impulses, but it's just not expressed in quite as many characters or as frequently when he gets to the Henry IV plays. But again, I think this is not a case of like, and then Shakespeare stopped caring about writing women because he's writing Rosalind like two years before. So obviously he cares. He just doesn't see them. He's sort of realized that like there's more fruitful genres for sort of exploring these types of characters maybe in histories. E.M.W. Tilliard writes that the second part of Henry VI had showed us the murder of Duke Humphrey of Gloucester, the rise of York, the destruction of two of Humphrey's murderers and the enmity of the two survivors, York and Queen Margaret. Through these happenings, the country had been brought to the edge of chaos. In the third part, Shakespeare shows us chaos itself, the full prevalence of civil war, the perpetration of one horrible deed after another. In the second part, there had remained some chivalric feeling, but in the third, all the decencies of chivalric warfare are abandoned. This chaos Tilliard talks about is palpable from the start. At times, the third part of Henry VI can feel like multiple revenge tragedies running at the same time. Margaret wants revenge on York. York, confronted with Margaret and her army, says, My ashes, as the phoenix, may bring forth a bird that will revenge upon you all. The sons of York get their own revenge on Margaret when they stab her son to death in front of her. After his father was killed in part two, Clifford's thirst for revenge is perhaps the most vivid and uncontrollable in the play. His hatred of any member of the House of York is such a torment to his soul that he kills Rutland, another son of York, one who is only a child. More than any other character, Clifford voices the insatiability of revenge, telling the pleading Rutland, Had thy brethren here, thy lives and thine were not revenge sufficient for me. No, if I digged up thy forefathers' graves and hung their rotten coffins up in chains, it could not slake mine ire nor ease my heart. Appearing almost as many times as the word revenge is the word wind. Throughout the play, an ill wind is blowing, one that profits nobody. Shakespeare takes the world back to a time before order, where discordant elements clashed, as in the creation story found in Ovid's Metamorphoses. All characters are at the mercy of this wind, this fury of their own making. York, before he dies, says that Margaret shall get her wish and see him weep, For raging wind blows up incessant showers, and when the rage allays, the rain begins. By contrast, for his still raging son Richard, it is the wind that keeps him from falling to tears at the news of his father's death. I cannot weep, says the younger Richard, for all my body's moisture scarce serves to quench my furnace-burning heart. Nor can my tongue unload my heart's great burthen, For self-same wind that I should speak with all is kindling coals that fires all my breast and burns me up with flames that tears would quench. Warwick, the setter-up and plucker-down of kings, is called wind-changing Warwick. It is he, says Margaret, who moves both wind and tide. Appropriately for this airy, wind-blown play, birds are mentioned throughout. The dove, the falcon, the fatal screech-owl, the night crow, the raven, the swan, the empty eagle... All of these are flung about on the wind, just as our characters are. As Jack Cade says in part two, was ever feather so lightly blown to and fro as this multitude? When you talk about it being difficult to find a theme in the history plays, I think that what contributes to that is this sense of like you're sort of continually being destabilized and disoriented about who you have sympathy for Mm. in exactly the way you describe. And I think that feels particularly vivid in the Henry VI plays where so many of the characters are so venal and awful and are doing (laughs) such horrible things all the time. And yet these same characters turn around and will give this beautiful speech. Mm. The character I always think about with this is uh, young Clifford, Mm. who in Henry VI part three is just like the, you know, most brutal, most violent, most vicious. He like kills a kid and doesn't care. But, you know, you know as well that he's had this beautiful speech, you know, mourning the death of his father, Mm. which isn't to say that that justifies it. But it is this sort of like, oh, gosh, you're awful. But oh, man, that speech was beautiful. Like it's you never really know where to locate yourself within any character, um, which is, I think, exaggerated with these lower class characters 
in a lot of ways because they're sort of the outsiders to the normal history play world maybe but again why that's the case is who knows it's tempting to come up with reasons like perhaps that they offer a bit more freedom to a writer because they're not yeah. na- they're, you know they're not they're not indebted to history they can sort of run a bit wilder with them yeah absolutely I mean and as we I don't know if you went into this near Henry the fourth episodes you know we see with Falstaff when you're talking about lords whose descendants are alive yeah you <laughs> you sometimes are constrained a little bit by who might get mad about what you say but if it's Jack Cade you're free to kind of insinuate and say whatever you want to say Shakespeare may have been flying a little close to the wind himself by his inclusion of a character named Sir John Somerville A minor character from Warwickshire, he shares a name with his descendant, John Somerville, who married into Shakespeare's mother's family. This later John Somerville was a Catholic and got himself arrested after letting a few too many friends aware of his plans to shoot the Queen. He died in prison in 1583, and his Shakespeare connection has long been held up as evidence in the debate about the playwright's own Catholicism. Looking at Shakespeare's history plays not in order of composition but in historical order, we see a story of monarchical decline. The holy office of king is degraded, where in Richard II even the king's usurpers profess to love him still. By the time we get to Henry VI, the king is seized by his own subjects, who treat him with no more reverence than a deer who skins a keeper's fee. Henry's humiliation is absolute. He proves how wrong Richard II was in saying not all the water in the rough rude sea can wash the balm off from an anointed king. On the contrary, the deposed Henry VI looks upon the England he has lost and says, No, Harry, Harry, it is no land of thine. Thy place is filled, thy sceptre wrung from thee, thy balm washed off wherewith thou wast anointed. As we have seen before in these plays, the degradation of the king is met by a parallel degradation in the body politic, the state. For all Falstaff's modernity and excellent wit, he is also the embodiment of corruption and disease. Henry VI also stresses this relationship between state of the monarchy and state of the people. On the sidelines of the Battle of Towton, King Henry despairs from the top of a molehill. There he is joined on stage by a son carrying the body of a man he has slain in battle. This son is looking forward to robbing the corpse when he discovers to his distress that the man he has killed is his own father. Weep, wretched man, says the horrified Henry looking on. I'll aid thee tear for tear, and let our hearts and eyes like civil war be blind with tears and break o'ercharged with grief. Sensing this wasn't quite on the nose enough, Shakespeare then has a father entering carrying another body. He too is about to loot the corpse when he discovers he has killed his own son. The cries of the father, Ah, no, 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 it is mine only son, are met with fresh grief from the monarch. Woe above woe, grief more than common grief. And so we have this histrionic scene of almost choral lamentation, which sits as oddly in the play as a king on a molehill. The overblown theatrics belie overblown history. As Peter Saccio has said, Shakespeare's plays greatly exaggerate the turmoil of the Wars of the Roses, during which peasants mostly tilled their fields, merchants mostly tended to trade, and England did not suffer the devastation that had occurred in northern France during the Hundred Years' War. Those who suffered most were the noble combatants themselves, The Tudor vision of catastrophic convulsion in the mid-15th century England was born largely of propaganda. The decline described by all eight plays appears to uphold this Tudor myth. After the wrongful dethronement of Richard II, England atones in blood until at last the future Henry VII, seen as a child in this play, will unite the warring houses and restore the country to peace. I asked Hayley Backrack what she made of this narrative of dynastic decline and revival. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really interesting because, of course, when you when you do read them in sort of king chronological order from Richard to Richard, Richard II to Richard III, it feels like obviously this is the sort of like narrative that's taking place. You're sort of descending deeper and deeper into hell until the devil himself is king just because this great act of heaven defying of usurpation happened and that's you know the reading that emw tilliard in the 1940s sort of put this forward as like this is the arc of the history plays and that's been like a super influential reading ever since Mm. um i think it's so hard to me 
when you really engage with the Henry VI plays to read them as they're so chaotic, you know, and there's so many characters and there's so many sort of like hairpin turns where it's like, oh, if that one thing hadn't happened, then none of these other things wouldn't happen. It's hard to feel like there's this sense of like, oh, it's being guided by the hand of like God and a curse and things like that. You know, there's so many moments where you're just like, there was no need, there was no need for that to happen. Like it was clear, it was purely sort of human stubbornness or pride or anger or sadness that are driving these events. And to me, they just don't, they don't, again, like when you take them in that whole shape, it's like, okay, I see how they fit this slot. But when you sort of take them on their own terms, it just doesn't feel doesn't feel like Henry's cursed. It feels like he's surrounded by assholes. <laughs> and that's the problem. Um, but at the same time, he's, you know, he, he's, he's the wrong king for the moment. That's what it feels like it's about, really. And maybe that's a curse, but maybe it's, yeah, I don't know. That's just to me, it just doesn't ever feel as orderly, I guess, as that. Yeah. And it's not very consistent with the idea of writing theatre, especially a kind of debut writer sort of having <laughs> having the foresight at <laughs> however old like 23 24 to go yeah I'll, I'll start this amazing sequence in the middle not quite the middle they'll work, work my way back a bit um yeah yeah wait 10 years wait and 10 then years. return <laughs> when I'm hugely successful yeah exactly I think they're I think they're about the two sets of plays feel like they're just interested in about two different things I think unquestionably at least Henry the Fourth is obsessed with this usurpation and its consequences. Mm. But I feel like Henry the Sixth isn't quite thinking about that in the same terms yet. Not least because it barely mentions Mister the Second. You know, it's not that's not really. I mean, it gets mentioned when the sort of characters are doing their like genealogy battles, but it's not sort of the source of obsession in the same way that it is in the Henry the Fourth plays. But Henry does at one moment recall Richard the Second. In his cell in the tower, we hear Richard despair eloquently on the subject of time. I wasted time, and now doth time waste me. For now hath time made me his numbering clock. My thoughts are minutes, and with sighs they jar. Their watches on unto mine eyes, the outward watch, where to my finger like a dial's point is pointing still, in cleansing them from tears. Now, sir, the sound that tells what hour it is are clamorous groans which strike upon my heart, which is the bell. So sighs and tears and groans show minutes, times and hours. From his molehill at Towton, Henry has his own private moment of despair, reflecting on time in similar terms to Richard, but with a quite different meaning. This battle fares like to the morning's war, when dying clouds contend with growing light. What time the shepherd, blowing of his nails, can neither call it perfect day nor night. Now sways it this way like a mighty sea, forced by the tide to combat with the wind. Now sways it that way, like the self-same sea, forced to retire by fury of the wind. Sometime the flood prevails, and then the wind. Now one the better, then another best, both tugging to be victors breast to breast, yet neither conqueror nor conquered. So is the equal of this fell war. Here on this molehill will I sit me down. To whom God will, there be the victory. For Margaret, my queen, and Clifford too, have chid me from the battle. Swearing both, they prosper best of all when I am fence. Would I were dead, if God's good will were so. For what is in this world but grief and woe? Ah, oh God, methinks it were a happy life to be no better than a homely swain. To sit upon a hill as I do now to carve out dials quaintly, point by point, thereby to see the minutes how they run, how many make the hour full complete, how many hours bring about the day, how many days will finish up the year, how many years a mortal man may live. When this is known, then to divide the times, so many hours must I tend my flock. So many hours must I take my rest. So many hours must I contemplate. So many hours must I sport myself. So many days 
my ewes have been with young. So many weeks ere the poor fools will e'en. So many years ere I shall shear the fleece. So minutes, hours, days, months, and years passed over to the end they were created would bring white hairs unto a quiet grave. Ah, what a life were this! How sweet! How lovely! Gives not the hawthorn bush a sweeter shade to shepherds looking on their silly sheep than doth a rich embroidered canopy to kings that fear their subjects' treachery. Oh, yes, it doth. A thousandfold it doth. And to conclude, the shepherd's homely curds, his cold, thin drink out of his leather bottle, his wonted sleep under a fresh tree's shade, all which, secure and sweetly, he enjoys, is far beyond a prince's delicates, his viands sparkling in a golden cup, his body couched in a curious bed, when care, mistrust, and treason waits on him. While Richard was horrified by time wasting him, gripped in a sudden shock of mortality following his abrupt fall from kingship, Henry not only wishes he were dead, but the characteristics of time that tortured Richard actually bring him solace. Queen Margaret is off the mark when she accuses Henry of loving his life more than his honour. On the contrary, Henry repeatedly prefers his own death to the suffering of others. Oh, that my death would stay these rueful deeds, he exclaims, seeing the father who has unknowingly murdered his son. Henry's failing is not cowardice or self-preservation, but an excess of charity and forgiveness. As Peter Hall has said, here is the central irony of the plays. Henry's Christian goodness produces evil. While in political terms we might call Henry ineffectual and submissive, he believes unequivocally in the power vested in him by God, and also makes earnest attempts to improve his rule. Come wife, he says in part two, let's in and learn to govern better. For yet may England curse my wretched reign. But his dominant characteristic is his holiness. After his restoration, his immediate plans are to lead a private life and in devotion spend my latter days to sin's rebuke and my creator's praise. It is in this vein that he is remembered, mourned in Richard III as the poor key-cold figure of a holy king, pale ashes of the house of Lancaster. You say, you know, he's, 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 he's very consistent. He obviously, this covers an enormous portion of his life. Does he change in any particular ways throughout um, the plays, other than obviously being a boy in the first part? Um, he does change. I think it's interesting because, again, it, it's, it's again not to say that this is a weakness, but I, I kind of diagnose him a little bit as having empathy overload. <laughs> I think someone, he kind of takes on too much of people's feelings, negative or mostly negative I mean like how he falls in love with Margaret for example is through empathy through the sense of you know the way that Suffolk describes her is that he falls in love with him almost Mm. in that moment and every single situation he feels basically he doesn't have that political astuteness to separate himself from the situation Mm. and I think his change really comes in isolation funnily enough when he, you know, in terms of when he is essentially locked down and sent to the tower, when we meet him again, we see a change in him, I think. Mm. He has found a sense of inner peace and maybe the sense of healthy removal from taking on a world's problems. And I think he's quite, an, I think it's quite, you know, people always, you know, he becomes, it comes on like this robe Jesus-like and it's serene and, you know, suddenly, but... I think there is something happens to him off stage, which mm. I think Shakespeare wants us to to acknowledge. And he he's given his religion is given real scope. His faith has been given space to grow, and you know I think it's a change that we see off stage, which I think is really interesting. As you say, unfashionable time to have empathy and not much, uh, not as much political cunning as mm-hmm. either Richard III or his, his father, Henry V. Well, it's interesting to question in terms of like, 
what we need from our leaders mm. and why why empathy is important or maybe why empathy is is vital i think for leaders to have but how it's responded to i think sometimes can be interesting yeah. i think you know we we want empathy but at the same time we we also want this kind of political rigor and strength and can you have both leaders um i think it's really interesting to be doing the play now just in terms of the political landscape of the world really in terms of extreme uh, how extreme it is and um some leaders are are, are really fueling um hatred and fueling division and how a character like henry the sixth might be heard now in this political landscape and maybe there's something in him that we will admire more in him henry has to actually remind the representatives of the warring houses i am a king and privileged to speak although henry's voice goes unheard it has a habit of revealing the depredation of others Confronted with the head of York, Henry does not rejoice, but says, Withhold revenge, dear God, tis not my fault, nor wittingly have I infringed my vow, prompting Clifford to recommend that harmful pity be laid aside. For too long, Henry behaves as if harmony remains an option for his feuding nobles, that ancient bickerings can be soothed with love. He has chosen a most inappropriate age in which to find inner peace. My crown is in my heart, he says, not on my head. Not decked with diamonds and Indian stones, nor to be seen. My crown is called content. A crown it is that seldom kings enjoy. But contentment is also a crown that makes him ludicrous. Though not made explicit in the play, Henry VI was in fact plagued with repeated attacks of madness throughout his life. It first struck on a hunting expedition in 1453 when he was physically incapacitated by a sudden and thoughtless fright. He became unresponsive and even the following year couldn't recognise his own son. Though Shakespeare's Henry faints in part two at the news of Gloucester's death and throughout the plays often seems frail, he also demonstrates understanding of the modern climate even if he is impotent in influencing it. Look, he tells the men who capture him, as I blow this feather from my face, and as the air blows it to me again, obeying with my wind when I do blow, and yielding to another when it blows, commanded always by the greater gust, such is the likeness of you common men. The flightiness of his people does not make him bitter. After being released from imprisonment, which historically lasted for five and a half years, Henry actually thanks his jailer. For well using me, Be thou sure I'll well requite thy kindness, for that it made my imprisonment a pleasure. I such a pleasure as encaged birds conceive, when after many moody thoughts at last, by notes of household harmony, they quite forget their loss of liberty. Despite everything, right up until the end, Henry believes that treating people kindly will solve all problems. He too has been deaf, and not heard Clifford speak of harmful pity. On the contrary, Before his murder, Henry is confident that my pity have been balm to heal their wounds, my mildness hath allayed their swelling griefs, my mercy dried their water-flowing tears. I have not been desirous of their wealth, nor much oppressed them with great subsidies, nor forward of revenge, though they much erred. Then why should they love Edward more than me? No, Exeter, these graces challenge grace, and when the lion fawns upon the lamb, the lamb will never cease to follow him. You know, I feel, I mean, I feel really bad for him. I think it's just so, he almost more than anybody feels to me like a completely different character in each of the plays. And so in some ways it's hard to talk about Mm. Henry as an, as an entity, because I think he sort of, yeah, he in the, in Henry VI part one, he's a child in Henry VI part two, the first scene of which takes place like 15 minutes after the last scene of part one, he is clearly um, a young man. (laughs) Uh, and then in Henry Six Part Three, he goes from he's a father of a grown child and is clearly implied to be kind of an old man by the end of the play. So it's like who him as like a, a human person, a single cohesive character is, I think, a difficult kind of yeah. track to follow. Um, but I, I mean, I think he's I find him really compelling. Um, I do feel sorry for him. I think that he's the sort of core of what a lot of the things that the play is trying to say about power and his sort of secondariness is really essential to 
kind of everything. I mean, obviously it's like sort of the catalyst for the plot, mm. but you know, I think that there's a real tendency to think that he must be ridiculous or sort of, I've seen a lot of productions that kind of try and look to history to kind of flesh him out as a character. And they're like, oh, well, the real Henry VI sort of had some unclear mental health crises mm. uh, later in his life. So, okay, maybe Shakespeare's Henry's mad. And it's like, well, that's textually clearly not what's happening at any point. Um, he's very sad, <laughs> but I don't think he's meant to be insane. Um, and sort of not understanding how to value and not understanding how original audiences, I think might have valued his religious devotion and his sort of he's not very confident and he's not very good at asserting himself mm. but he has a sort of moral core that nobody else has and I think when you sort of really take Henry seriously as a character and rather than just assuming that his sort of faith and mildness is meant to be completely ridiculous mm. even though there are certainly times when it is ridiculous I think it's making a really sort of interesting point that like to be a good king and maybe to be a good protagonist, you have to be a pretty awful person. Enter Edward IV. Shakespeare's Edward is wanton, weak-willed, and rash. Unlike his cleverer younger brother, Edward leans upon Warwick for his ascension. But after building his seat on Warwick's shoulder, King Edward makes a fool of his great supporter by marrying a widow at court, while Warwick is trying to engineer a marriage between Edward and the Lady Bona of France. The scene in which Edward tries to bed the Lady Grey is reminiscent not only of Henry V and Catherine, but also Edward III's ruthless pursuit of the married Countess of Salisbury. Like the Countess, the Lady Grey must express the love every subject owes their king, the love that virtue begs and virtue grants. But no, says Edward, I do not mean such love. Pressing his case and watched on by his amused brothers, Edward is rejected by the Lady Grey, who says, I know I am too mean to be your queen, and yet too good to be your concubine. Unlike the Countess before her, the Lady Grey does relent into marrying the King, a terrible miscalculation on Edward's part, who is swiftly and embarrassingly deposed by the vengeful Warwick. Edward, along with his brothers George and Richard, earlier saw a vision of three suns in the sky, and took it to symbolise the three sons of brave Plantagenet, who should notwithstanding join our lights together and overshine the earth as this the world. Edward IV adopted the sun in splendour as his emblem, but far from joining lights with his brothers, he is betrayed first by one, then the other. Never displaying the cunning of his brother or political guile of his father, Edward comes off as both a coward and a tyrant. It is he who first stabs the young Prince Edward before Richard and George join in. Chronicle accounts tend to disagree with Shakespeare's portrait, with Edward remembered as a tall, handsome and impressive king, though in the end undone by his excessive tastes. A more complimentary picture of Edward can be found in Thomas Hayward's two-part play about him. In Shakespeare, he serves to provide a stark contrast to King Henry and usher in his more devious younger brother. It is Richard, Duke of Gloucester, who makes sure of his brother's seat by murdering Henry in his cell. In Henry's final humiliation, he is cut off mid-sentence by Richard's dagger, who then gloats over him. What? Will the aspiring blood of Lancaster sink in the ground? I thought it would have mounted. See how my sword weeps for the poor king's death. Oh, may such purple tears be always shed from those that wish the downfall of our house. If any spark of life be yet remaining, down, down to hell, and say I sent thee thither. Ha! I, that have neither pity, love, nor fear. Indeed, tis true that Henry told me of, for I have often heard my mother say I came into the world with my legs forward. Had I not reason, think ye, to make haste, and seek their ruin that usurped our right. The midwife wondered, and the women cried, Oh, Jesus, bless us, he is born with teeth. And so I was, which plainly signified that I should snarl and bite and play the dog. Then, since the heavens have shaped my body so, let hell make crooked my mind to answer it. 
I have no brother. I am like no brother. And this word love, which greybeards call divine, be resident in men like one another and not in me. I am myself alone. Clarence, beware. Thou keepst me from the light, but I will sort a pitchy day for thee. For I will buzz abroad such prophecies that Edward shall be fearful of his life, and then, to purge his fear, I'll be thy death. King Henry and the prince his son are gone. Clarence, thy turn is next, and then the rest, counting myself but bad till I be best. I'll throw thy body in another room and triumph, Henry, in thy day of doom. <laughs> yeah. Moments before he dies, Henry prophesies that thousands will regret that Richard was ever born. The owl shrieked at thy birth, he says, an evil sign. The night crow cried a boding luckless time. Dogs howled and hideous tempests shook down trees. The raven rooked her on the chimney's top and chattering pies in dismal discords sung. Thy mother felt more than a mother's pain and yet brought forth less than a mother's hope. To wit, an indigested and deformed lump, not like the fruit of such a goodly tree. Teeth hast thou in thy head when thou wast born to signify thou camest to bite the world. Richard is the chaos of a disordered world personified, an indigested lump, Again, the language recalls that found in the creation story of Ovid's Metamorphoses. Richard was born into the winds whipped up by his father. The Black Storm, the Duke of York called it, that which shall blow ten thousand souls to heaven or hell, and this fell tempest shall not cease to rage until the golden circuit on my head, like to the glorious sun's transparent beams, do calm the fury of this mad-bred floor. In a sense, Richard Plantagenet was right when he said this in part two. Though he himself was only crowned with a paper circuit, his son and namesake will be crowned with a golden one in the following play, and only after then will the fury finally be calmed. As for Henry, who has heard of his son's murder at the hands of the York brothers, at the sight of Richard, finally cannot bear to press for peace and reconciliation any more. Ah, kill me with thy weapon, not with words, he tells Richard. My breast can better brook thy dagger's point than can my ears that tragic history. Henry has endured more than he can take and witnessed, as Gillian Day writes, the heraldry and ritual of parts one and two fragment. The surviving relics of those rituals find their humble counterparts in a molehill throne and a paper crown. We have come a long way indeed from the ornate ceremonial court of Richard II. In wondering why Shakespeare began here in this fallen world, E.M.W. Tilliard says, Perhaps he thought that vice was easier to picture than virtue, hell than paradise, and that it would be safer to spend his present energies on pictures of chaos and a great villain, leaving the more difficult picture of princely perfection to his maturity. I've always been kind of interested in this. By the end of part three, Henry has suffered a fate rather similar to Richard II. And mm -hmm. throughout them, th there seems to be this sort of perils of forgetting history, uh, it repeating. Mm. People suddenly, the way people get written off is very interesting. The way that people connected to Henry V just vanish at the beginning of Henry VI. It's not a, quite a clean mm -hmm. slate. It's more like a, a rate, scrub them out. <laughs> there does seem to be a, a just t too tempting correlation between that and the idea of history suddenly being in the theatre and people learning a lot about history, heard about their history perhaps for the first time or perhaps for the first time in much depth. And here they were being warned about not being able to, you know, not forgetting it. Yeah, I think there's absolutely sort of meta meditations in the history plays about what history is and mm. what it's for and what it like means. I had this professor who said that that's the difference between a history play and a historical play, mm. which is a play with a historical setting can be about whatever, but a history play is always on some level about history. And I think that that is what makes 
them awesome mm -hmm. um, in my opinion but also i think sort of what makes them a genre there's a lot of people now who sort of argue that like well like history play isn't really a genre so much as it is like a subject matter and they might be comic and they might be tragic but like there are no sort of like formal structural traits that indicate that something is a history play mm. besides the setting and therefore can you really call it a genre but i do think these sort of meditations on history itself kind of constitute a genre in certain ways and they're sort of there's a scholar who talks about their sense of embeddedness mm. is key a history play is always aware that it is one event that has a past and a future mm. and those things can never be contained on the stage and like that's why history plays are so obsessed with prophecy because it's the one genre where you can whip out a prophecy and the audience automatically knows like okay that's going to come true <laughs> yeah. like because we know for sure what's going to happen yeah and even if we don't the sort of conventions of the genre help us say like okay well now i know what's going to happen because it's a history play and they wouldn't say that if it wasn't what was going to happen yeah but the idea of like, yeah, I mean, and then there's something about that sort of it being on stage and being sort of, yeah, being in this form that can't contain the totality of history. Mm. Obviously, a chronicle can't either, but I think it's easier for a chronicle to pretend that it can and does. And at least you can turn back in the chronicle. You know, exactly yeah. yeah you can turn back turn forward you can add more oh my gosh like Holland Shed's Chronicles there were like 50 editions and everyone added more and more and more stuff yeah. so it's like you can keep changing it but the play is sort of has to be aware of its own limitations and that's something that I think really marks Shakespeare's history plays in particular in my opinion is this awareness of we are depicting something that we actually are incapable of depicting mm. yeah was it um, was it Tilliard who said that maybe it's someone else, but his his theory included the idea of the thing about the history plays is that the nation, like England, is the protagonist, not the protagonist, but the the sort of mm. the main character who is always at risk or being being saved, and then people come and go, and then th that seems to fit in with what you said about the idea of yeah. history plays. It kind of explains the chaos and explains the, well, who's the main character? Why is it called Henry VI? Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's not. That sounds like Tilliard. I don't, I don't remember if it was him, but it sounds like, yeah, I mean, I think that that's sort of, I think that, yeah, there's definitely an element of that. It's a, these are about something sort of more enduring than yeah. any individual on the stage. Mm. Is, there a, is there a more modern equivalent of that kind of epic undertaking of history plays? You, well, yeah. I mean, I think in terms of, in terms of something that's seeking to depict factual events probably not mm. i mean it's tacky but i'm gonna go back to my reference to comic book movies because <laughs> i actually do think that that's something that like there is an awareness for people who know which i actually am not mm. that there is this whole undepictable lore that like gets glanced at and referenced and is sort of like available for mining and may or may not be drawn upon like this sense of like we are watching one little sliver of this massive yeah, thing yeah. actually to me really applies to Marvel movies like you go with someone who like reads comic books and they'll start laughing at something and you'll just be like <laughs> I don't know what that's a reference to but it's clearly a reference to something someone just shoots a look at a hammer and everyone gasps yeah exactly and you're like oh, okay <laughs> and I think that's actually sort of how history plays function as well as you can embed these little bits and I think that's what makes them feel so rich is like you can just sort of allude to something yeah and you'll just be like oh my god that's so amazing that's a reference to this thing and like people who don't know don't know but people who do do and mm. um it's <laughs> maybe less high-minded and <laughs> than history plays but then again I think uh history plays are kind of pretty trashy in their own way as well so Oh, plenty of plenty of uh, lasciviousness and lurid yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you've got you've got um, uh, Robert Schenken's Lyndon B. Johnson plays, mm. uh, which are sort of very self consciously trying to be Shakespearean historical drama, which unfortunately he takes to mean no woman can have more than two lines <laughs> in any play. Um, and there's two of them, and I think there's going to be a third, and that sort of it was commissioned by the Oregon Shakespeare Festival as part of what is slash was it's over now called the American Revolutions Project, which was trying, which was commissioning writers to write history plays sort of in the vein of Shakespeare, but about American history. Oh, and wow. this play all the way about Lyndon B. Johnson was the first one. It was there and it went to Broadway and there's actually, then they made an HBO series. And then there was a second one called the great society, which was supposed to go to Broadway this year. Um, and obviously yeah. isn't. Um, and I think, I heard there'd be a third but maybe not maybe that's just me wanting things to be neatly mm. trilogies um and that's a project that is kind of trying to do that thing 
I mean, the crown, yeah, I guess. Yeah. I, I think the crown is trying to do that for sure. Sort of mythologize and document and... Not necessarily have a central character and be through yeah, the eyes I mean, of dot, dot, dot. Right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, and like even the way that they change casts, it mm. sort of forces you to let go of the sort of loyalty to character that you want to have. Because on the one hand, you're like, yeah, it's still Queen Elizabeth, but like, I miss... I miss Claire Foy's Elizabeth. Like <laughs> yeah. she was different. She was a different person. Yeah. I mean, you know, so I guess that, but yeah, I mean, I don't know what it is. I think we just are a little more, I mean, I think it's partly that because we care a lot more about historical accuracy than they did. Yes. It's harder to kind of use history as a jumping off point for just sort of like exploration of ideas yeah. because we just now it's just like well you're just gonna get slated for getting things wrong yeah so <laughs> it becomes a different project when like you have to be that concerned about getting things accurate yeah and i suppose the historical figures and periods that would be of commercial interest are also periods that are kind of on record um yeah exactly. and often the figures themselves speaking so if you suddenly well if you had them speaking in verse that would be pretty wild but if you, um, yes. <laughs> if, even if you change their rhythms, you might get slated for that, which is a shame, I think. Yeah, I do. I think so as well. I think that there's something obviously really liberating and exciting about sort of being a little less fast about. I mean, it, this is ironic because like with all the stuff around Hamilton, I was like, historical accuracy is important because <laughs> I'm a dick. Um, but, you know, at the same time, there's something uh, really liberating about the ways there's this whole sort of subgenre of history play in Shakespeare's period that scholars call historical comedies, mm. um, where basically like the king or whoever is this sort of subplot side character. And most of the play is about completely other random shit. Mm. Like, I think Henry the Fourth Part Two is like almost a historical comedy because you're just sort of like, sorry, <laughs> where is the king? Like, where are any of the actual people who are these country justices? Um, and there will often be, um, you know, so it'll often be about like a king who's like trying to seduce a commoner. That's like the really common central plot mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, Edward the Fourth goes off and just like has an affair with this fictional female character. And it's sort of this like imagining this side episode in the lives of a historical figure. And I think there's something really exciting and like uh, generative about being able to be like, okay, okay, we're going to tell, you know, we're going to do a movie about Queen Elizabeth, I guess, but instead of it being about anything that actually happened, it's going to be about the imaginary time that she, you know, went on a trip to Brighton and like almost cheated on Albert or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. Like, <laughs> why would that sound terrible? No one make that. But, you know, it's like, but there's, you know, what they had so much more willingness to find these little pockets of like, okay, well, so we've got the, I mean, again, it's this comic book movie idea. You're right. Sure. We've got the plot line of Spider-Man, but what if there's this side plot where he goes and has this other adventure and like that just sort of, we just accept it. Like that happened at some point in his chronology of his superhero life. Yeah. It is. Again, it's like, it comes back to this, um, the unaccounted periods in the yeah. writing, the Elizabethan history plays. It's, um, it's yeah. like, a, oh, there's a lost weekend here where I don't think anyone knows where Queen Elizabeth was. I, <laughs> I see a two-part <laughs> love romp. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. We get so, but we're so sort of fixated now on like kind of disguising historical inaccuracy whenever we can mm. and sort of making it as subtle and unnoticeable as possible, um, which is sometimes kind of boring. Kind of boring, yeah, yeah. Come hither, England's hope, says Henry VI, upon seeing the young Earl of Richmond, the future Henry VII. This pretty lad will prove our country's bliss. But not until England has suffered a final convulsion and another wretched reign. Next time on Here Read This, we will look at the last history play in this sequence, Richard III. For now, a huge thank you to my guests, Owen Horsley, Hayley Backrack, and Danielle Farrow. Until next time, happy reading.